Um, so I am going to bring up our first moderator. It's one of my favorite humans um, on planet Earth. Um, many of you are familiar with her from her um, dynamic economic work and social incubation work at um, The Hub, where she is a co-founder. Um, she's right here. Her name is Penelope Douglas. Welcome all to Robbie Sillian Hunter. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, gosh. My, uh, my thought as I was walking up here was, what do you call a moderator for instigators? Does anybody have any ideas? I decided maybe I was a generator or something like that. Um, so I'm going to try to generate um, exactly what Mark just described to you. And uh, in order to do that, I need to welcome on stage uh, four amazing people who are part of the YBCA 100. So if Anthony and Aaron and Robert and um, Fabiana will join me, that would be great. And I think I sit in the middle of all of you. <laughs> this looks pretty comfortable up here. So um, I know you've been told no relaxing. And for us, same thing. <laughs> so Anthony, I think we're just going to let you get started, OK? Um, Great. <clears throat> thanks. Uh, so, <clears throat> my name is Anthony Mint. I'm the co founder of Mission Chinese Food and Commonwealth, and I'm working on a new restaurant called The Perennial. Uh, it should be open in a month or two, and it has a focus on uh, basically environmentalism and progressive agriculture. Um, so if you've ever been to Mission Chinese Food, it's kind of like a dive bar. Basically, it's really red. There's a Chinese New Year's dragon. It's uh, kind of like a party scene. And so I was a little surprised at the first one. Uh, I was invited to the panel, and then it became about instigation. Uh, but so today I'm putting on my instigator hat and talking about some issues that um, I think we're going to try to tackle in kind of a restaurant setting at the perennial. Uh, so my first question is, can our food evolve fast enough? Um, so if you, I mean, I probably don't need to tell anybody, but climate change is real, and it's you know, probably like the defining issue of our generation and stuff. Um, if you look at this graph, you know, it's basically pretty simple. Uh, things that are not related to food, 50% of climate change. Things that are related to food, including deforestation, the other 50%. Um, so that's a lot. Um, so then, <clears throat> I guess here's a question. What changes are needed for agriculture to adjust to the reality of climate change? So I feel like agriculture has been around for you know, 10,000 years. And as a whole civilization, we've maybe embraced or understood climate change for you know, 10 years or 20 years. So you know, the other question here is, uh, Where's all that root mass if it's not in the ground? And so, you know, a thousand years ago, someone invented the plow, and it's really allowed civilization to flourish. But what has happened is that it's also kind of undermined soil biology and released all the carbon that has been in the ground into the atmosphere, which is causing a lot of problems now. Um, and in part, that's why the restaurant's named the perennial, uh, because I think perennial agriculture and kind of changing our general orientation of agriculture from something annual to something perennial uh, is really important. Um, so another kind of similar thing is, uh, you know, there's a lot of systems in place that evolved out of, you know, economics and uh, just trying to get maximum yield or different things. You know, one question is, like, there's a fish farm and why is that fish farm creating toxic runoff when not very far away there's a, a, you know, someone's growing soybeans or something, and then they're also using fossil fuels to create fertilizer to fertilize the soybeans. You know, why not just use the system in nature? Um, and so, like, one thing that we'll be doing at the restaurant is aquaponics, which is where, you know, you, bacteria convert the fish waste into, uh, like, organic fertilizer for food. Um, so this is maybe more 
along the lines of instigation, uh, could progressive agriculture be the 21st century abolitionist movement? Um, I feel like, you know, slavery and the end of slavery and stuff maybe was a major change, uh, obviously, but you know, it, it also was a major economic opportunity. Um, and so I think, you know, as we shift towards ending kind of a reliance on fossil fuel, um, you know, I think we need to view that as an opportunity instead of an inconvenience. Um, so then, you know, the question is, what can a city slicker do about the broken food system? <clears throat> and I just did a Google search of the phrase eating as an agricultural act, and you know, there's like a million images of it. I really like this one on the top right of the woman like cradling the vegetables to her bosom. But um, <laughs> you know, I think basically uh, the, if you've ever tried to grow anything like in your backyard, you try to grow a pint of cherry tomatoes, it's freaking hard, you know, like it takes the whole season, you get one pint, you know, but as people in the city, we're pretty disconnected from that whole process. We, you know, I'll like eat a whole cherry tomato or like a burger or something without even thinking about it. And so, uh, you know, I guess basically just reorienting ourselves to that idea that eating is an agricultural act. And so I guess the question to close on is basically, uh, will <clears throat> or would you eat environmentally if it made a difference. Anthony, um, thank you first for being first among us. And uh, you have a lot of questions. <laughs> a lot of questions. So um, I may try to help think about that before we turn all this over to the audience. But let me let you go, Eric. Okay. <laughs> um, so my name is Erin McElroy. Um, I'm here with the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project. Um, I'm one of many people who works on the project. It's a collective, so um, it's not just me. Um, and also, we're really a baby in the housing rights movement. Um, we're just a few years old. And I think that when we think about innovation and new creative projects, it's important to also think about our ancestors and the different projects that came before us. And um, I, I just wanted to mark that it's about the 40th anniversary of the I Hotel, which is a huge um, housing rights uh, struggle that happened uh, mostly led by uh, the Filipino community 40 years ago. So I think that when we think about how to do new things, we really need to remember what's already been done and to you know, make sure those connections don't die. Otherwise, we just keep on repeating um, the same mistakes. Um, so in a nutshell, this is my question, which is really a big question. Um, <laughs> I'm asking, um, how do we build a movement that embraces both short-term and long-term goals so that we don't just only plan for the next election cycle, but for a deeper more and more radical sustained struggle against the morphing impositions of capitalism, oppression, and dispossession. And again, how can we learn from prior histories of resistance against displacement in doing so? Um, so we began the mapping project because, as probably most of you know, there's a huge eviction crisis plaguing San Francisco right now. Um, it's really picked up over the last uh, four or so years. Um, over the last five years, I think evictions in general have risen 80%, and some of them have risen up to you know, 200%, um, such as the Ellis Act and a lot of these no-fault evictions. And in San Francisco right now, because rents are so high, if you're evicted from your home, you're really evicted from the city. And you know, being evicted from the city means also being evicted from your community, um, from legacy, from, from what you've been building for sometimes you know, generations. And so it's, it's actually a crisis. And uh, we began the mapping project because we wanted to, to help document that, but also to help uh, broaden the discourse. Because again, I think it's really easy to just take note of what's happening so quickly because it is happening so quickly. But we really want to um, also learn about those histories and how to keep these um, struggles against uh, dispossession alive um, throughout different generations. And also um, right now, because uh, of the current capitalistic system that we're imbricated in, um, you know, money accumulates in San Francisco, but it's part of a global um, economy, right? Um, Silicon Valley, which is generating a lot of money, has, uh, you know, it's stored in uh, particular places in San Francisco, um, but it also accumulates that money um, by <laughs> re extracting resources and labor from across the globe. And I think that um, there's this really strange tension in San Francisco right now where, um, there's this idea that a lot of the new uh, projects that are starting are immaterial and have no material effects, but they actually do have material effects. And that's what we're trying to um, 
make more visible in the mapping project. So we, we make maps. This is our oral history map where we've collected about uh, 50 stories now of folks who have been impacted by gentrification. And um, you can listen to them. Some of them are about an hour long. Some are, are snippets of five minutes or so. And see, these are some of my friends who I've been um, working with over the last few years to help them stay in their homes. Um, and uh, this is a project we did with a group in New Orleans called the Land of Opportunity. And what it is, it's an interactive video piece. So we have this base layer video of my friend Benito Santiago, who fought his eviction and won through um, direct action. He was being evicted by a real estate speculator um, called Pineapple Boy LLC, uh, <laughs> a shell company of, a, of somebody in real estate. And we're seeing this all over San Francisco right now, where there are these shell companies basically parading as uh, landlords and evicting tenants to create housing for people with a lot more money. Um, but Benito fought his eviction and won through direct action. Um, and we made this piece about him. And of course, if this was live, I could show you. But these little blue um, rectangles on the bottom um, are other stories and maps and articles. So as you're watching his story, they pop up, and you can learn about the history of uh, colonization um, in San Francisco, right? Because that's the first moment of dispossession that we really need to remember when we think about who's been removed. Um, but you can also learn about housing struggles in um, New York or in Chicago or, or Detroit because, again, this is happening not just in San Francisco, even if it's happening really quickly here. And then my last slide is um, a mural project that we did in Clarion Alley in collaboration with the Clarion Alley um, mural project. And what we did was we painted our um, oral history map on the wall, and we had uh, this dedication ceremony where uh, we featured nine stories and um, those nine stories, the people <laughs> represented in those stories came and spoke. And um, we included uh, Alex Nieto, who was murdered by the police in San Francisco last year, because we really want to make these connections between uh, racial profiling and gentrification. Um, Alex was killed because somebody saw him and thought he was suspicious, um, even though he was just sitting on a park bench. But because he was a person of color, he was reported to the police, who then came and killed him. So um, we really want to make these connections uh, you know, between increased racial profiling, gentrification, displacement, et cetera, um, because I think that's not happening enough. OK, so I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I forewarned them. <laughs> Beautifully done. And by the way, it's amazing that you can expose this amount of information in five minutes. I'm, I'm awed. So Robert, let's see how you do. OK. Um, <laughs> well, uh, I'm Robert Miller Anderson, and uh, I think I'm moved now to, uh, to, to move to a ditty of ours, which is San Francisco, open your golden gate. Don't let no stranger wait outside your door. San Francisco. Here comes your wandering one, saying I'll wander no more. And then I'd like to read this from the journal of Father Vincente Santa Maria on the first exploration of San Francisco Bay in 1775. Our men stayed longer with the little Indians than with the women, feeling great commiseration for those innocents whom they could not readily help under the many difficulties that would come with them. Uh, the carrying out of a new and far-reaching extension of Spanish authority. So my question is, fight or flight as a species, how do we know when to migrate? And one of the things I'm working on now is a movie called Windows on the World, um, which is about a kid whose father is a busboy on the Windows of the World restaurant. And so after 9-11, when the building comes down, uh, the weekly checks and phone st calls stop coming to the family. Um, but in the third week, the mother swears that she sees on news footage her husband getting out of the building safe. So the son has to take his money, uh, his savings, and, and, and make the migration to New York. And this is because of clearly uh, economic displacement, um, seemingly in one place, that affects the whole globe. He ends up getting a job also as a window washer from a Nigerian who has also experienced uh, what other people may not even know, which was the Biafra War. Uh, where there was a massacre of 200,000 dead and 2 million dead by the end of the war, uh, for a little perspective. Um, and then I'm working on a novel right now called The Sin to Stay Down. Um, and it is about how the environment and climate change has affected species as well, and uh, our working class crunch up in Mendocino County. Um, but because of the environment, um, no logs, so no loggers, no fishermen, so no fish. No truckers anymore because there's nothing to truck. 
nobody uh, working on mechanics really because there's no skidders and there's no trucks. But there is a huge uh, marijuana industry up there. Simultaneously, in a little town called Uruapan in Michoacan, um, there's a huge uh, bunch of people that have not had to leave because of the avocados. Um, half of Michoacan has uh, immigrated at one point to the United States, but the avocado fields have given jobs to our main character. But the mafia has taken over the avocado fields, causing him to leave and then uh, end up working, unbeknownst to him, in the marijuana fields for the same mafia down in uh, Michoacan. Interesting enough, too, there's uh, the largest, uh, uh, it's called the biosphere, uh, the largest uh, migration of monarch butterflies um, that cross from Uruapan and Michoacan over into the United States. And uh, the monarch is one of the only species that uh, makes its migration without any member of its family, uh, a grandfather butterfly, a grandfather sparrow, or something like that, or the swallows, uh, ever taking the trip. In fact, five generations will live and die before it migrates, and it knows when to migrate and where. And if you go back five generations or so, this, lo and behold, was, was Mexico. So this gentleman is not crossing any borders at all. Um, working on... Um, Another thing called The Death of Teddy Ballgame, which is a play that essentially takes place in Cafe Trieste uh, after the apocalypse. <laughs> um, everything bad has happened, and it has happened in uh, you know, nuclear uh, war, SARS, pollution. And it's about how, in the face of that, we create community and ritual and culture. Something else I worked on was the SF Jazz Center, um, where I felt uh, the culture of the city was, was changing and uh, becoming gentrified, another kind of migration. Um, and so uh, that's another way of, of, of basically trying to fight instead of flight. And uh, these people have to decide whether they go look for air pockets in Canada or stay here and wait for their loved ones to come home, creating a semblance of community, not knowing if this is the day they can drink their coffee or not. Of course, those people are all people who live in SROs and stuff because they, they don't have the money to go. Uh, this is another way uh, I'm trying to help, which is uh, trying not to, to, to kill the planet and to, to have things work which is a, a bottle company uh, with reusable pods that ends up basically saving 90% of, of the waste that's going out, including the trucking uh, and shipping of it all. And then lastly, you just got to get out in the streets and you talk to people, <laughs> which I think is not necessarily happening in San Francisco as, as things change. As 30 years ago, our firemen and police officers and nurses and teachers were all displaced to, to live somewhere other than the city. And I think that's unbelievably changed things. And certainly Greece is going through an economic pyramid scheme and trying to fight their way. And, and they might have to migrate right there in the, the possibly the, 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 the basis of Western civilization. Well done. And uh, <laughs> we share California history in common. And, uh, you know, many of you know about the monarch, I'm sure, in Mexico. But they don't migrate anymore to... Right? They're, they're, they're some some of them do. Pattern. Some of them still make it all the way to Montana. They do. Yeah. yeah. Um, I found some in my garden the other day and I was thrilled. Yeah. Um, it's, so is it. it's a species watch for sure, like right, right with the bee. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to stand up. Hi, everyone. You can, um, you can make I'm, us dance if you want. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm an artist, and I'm going to share my theory of change and how art is a way to shift power and transform our communities and heal ourselves. I grew up in Oakland. I'm the daughter of a migrant family. And um, in a lot of the, the work that I do, I've consistently fought for power, whether it was around evictions or around fighting for immigration reform. And uh, my story is that uh, I, as I was growing up, my parents' um, education meant everything to them. And uh, it was all about math, science, math, science. You know, my parents didn't go to college. So um, I would go to Saturday Engineering Academy and to uh, after school math classes and to summer. And I always knew I wanted to be an artist, but my parents said, we didn't migrate here for you to be an artist. Uh, and so. Um, I had graduated from high school with a 4.2 GPA, got $60,000 in scholarships to go to UC Berkeley. I was like the model Latina minority. And two years into college, I got pregnant and I got, had an abortion. And I was in the closet about my abortion for 10 years. And one thing I learned in the social justice space is that often 
in our movement, I believe that the, we are often stuck in the action space, and we're stuck in this space where we're often reactive, we're about the no, we're fighting against, we are only limited by what's politically feasible, by what those white men, overwhelmingly white men in Congress decide that can happen to our lives. And what art has taught me is that art is about imagination, art is about possibility, and it's about us, it's about the yes. It's not just about the no, it's about how we can imagine our futures free of racism, sexism, a place where all of us have access to health. And that is what I, um, th that is what I care about. That's where I think the power of art is. So in 2012, I came out about my abortion 10 years later. And I came out in a way where I said, you know what, I, I just, I'm tired of these politicians telling me what to do with my body. And, <laughs> thank you. And, and I, realize that, you know, this is not really about abortion. This is about shame and stigma, and it's actually about implicit bias. The same things that drive a, a system where we see black people being killed is the same system that tells women uh, to stay in the closet, that they should have shame, and that, that they are, their sexual morality is around duty, uh, and that we are, our bodies only matter uh, in, in the context of reproduction. So as I came out, I actually became a national spokesperson. And this is where, again, I think that artists have, we have the capacity to be bold, to be controversial, and also to uh, transform people in a way that could actually shift the national debate. I believe that that's how much power is in what we do. Uh, and so I, am a, I became a spokesperson. I was in Cosmo and Huffington Post just always talking about abortion. But again, as an artist, I said, you know what? Abortion is limiting us to what's politically feasible. Uh, let's think about our big, big imagination here. And you know what? I'm not just about the no. In birth control, when we talk about when these right-wingers are taking away our right to birth control, we say, no, we need birth control because we don't want to get pregnant. Well, you know what? We need birth control because, yes, we want to have sex. We want to feel good. That's our right as human beings. And it's especially, I think, that people of color have this taken away from them, which is our right to feel joy. And so I then thought, okay, well, what is... What, what is this bigger idea that I want to know? And you know what? A lot of you probably look at this and you look at a vagina. You think that's a vagina. You know, vagina is only one part of the vulva. Vagina is where something goes in and out. And it's sad that we've grown up in a culture of misinformation where a lot of people don't even know where a clitoris is. The clitoris, which is the only human organ that is exclusively for pleasure, 8,000 nerve endings, twice as many as a penis, and the sex education you get in schools makes it so that we are disappeared. And you know, if you wonder why we have a crisis where one in five young women at the university level is raped, it's because we have a crisis around sex education and we have a crisis around pleasure in this country. We are a pain-oriented society. And I think that especially as, as people who have experienced migration, people who, have, who, who are affected by inequities, that we have to begin to ask ourselves, joy. What is it that, how do we reclaim our joy? Because real liberation is our embodied liberation. And we have to ask the question, how do we feel pleasure? Pleasure is our right. Joy is our right. We are not just human beings here to be productive. We are here to feel good and to experience life in its fullest dimension. So my question to all of you today is, what is the pleasure that you want to add in your life? And how can we shift to a pleasure-oriented way of working. Thank you. Um, I could just keep clapping for all four, but um, it's, yeah. Okay, so now, it's, now we're putting you to work, and I'm just going to try to help us out being the sort of generator of the next uh, part of our work together by trying to reframe the four big questions. I'm going to do this really fast. Your job is to organize yourselves to take on the question that you want to think about. Your um, uh, aspiration is to bring back to us um, a better version of the question. Uh, what's, how do you add to how do you add to each question would be my question. <laughs> so um, to start, and, and Anthony had many questions, but I think if, if if I can respectfully restate, I think it's basically 
Could progressive agriculture be the abolitionist movement of the 21st century? Sure. That okay? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how do we create a movement for a sustained struggle? Close enough? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? That's good. Okay. Fight or flight? As a species, how do we know when, and I don't know how to end that sentence. When to migrate. When to migrate. Okay. And Faviana, if I have it right, it's basically, what is the pleasure that you want to have in your life, and, and what can we do together to create a life where we can experience full pleasure? Is that close enough? Okay. Can I, can I add to... You may. There is, if there is just a group of the people with the pleasure that maybe I could join that. <laughs> Thank you on that. Just hop like right off the more, stage. Yeah, I, was, I know I'm a panelist, but... I know, it's tempting for us to jump in, but we're... The lights go off in a certain section, and that's the pleasure center. <laughs> All right, so let's see. Um, how about if we have Anthony's question... Well, let's just sort of do it, like, in the obvious way. If you, if you want to talk about Anthony's question, kind of move this way fast. Um, et cetera, et cetera, across the room, okay? Just sort of put yourselves in front of your, your instigator and, and, and get going. <laughs> so and we'll figure out what we're doing for five minutes. In terms of like, uh, let me drink of water. I have four kids. You have kids? They can hear you. Oh, they can hear you? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Say what? Um, why not? Uh, Great. Uh, um, so I asked maybe, the, the question. Oh, we turn join us. Yeah, how do we turn these off? Patty. How do we turn these off? Or? Okay. Um, uh, can you guys talk? Can you yes, make that introduction? Okay. This is the. Uh, this is not, by the way, a break. <laughs> I'm supposed to um, generate the, the energy to stay in the room. So um, um, stay together and keep, keep working. Thank you. together, if I may, if I might. <laughs>
I shall try. <laughs> I shall try. And, and um, Jonathan, if I understand it correctly, there are mics in a couple of places. OK. So I just want to, be, because it's so beautiful, before you all go back to where you want to be, we up here are noticing that it's so interesting that people who love food gathered in a circle. <laughs> We're not exactly sure what people who love pleasure do, but, but they sort of look like a honeycomb. And those of you who are taking on sort of this huge systems question, you're, you're forming little knots. And Robert, I don't know, what do you think? It's happening in front of you. <laughs> the, um, all right, so the way this, I think this works um, is we need some uh, popcorn, basically. So we need you to uh, shout back at us how you've made any one of these questions better. And to keep my generator role sort of in control, if you could help by sort of saying, related to Anthony's question, as opposed to blah, so that I know which question you're talking about. OK, so go for it. Who's starting? Anybody? We need, a, we need a starting place. So this group decided to combine two questions. <laughs> we, couldn't, we couldn't choose. And the question that we threw out for conversation was, how can pleasure be part of sustaining struggle? Ah. Wow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm going to come back to the party. Next. Yeah. Woo! So I should um, make it over. Regarding Fabiana's theme, um, how can pleasure be taught in schools so kids can know their bodies and, and use them in a way that they feel like they can do it? They don't know they, they yeah, are bodies. Yeah, because they had a Beautiful. little... Uh, okay. Beautiful. You know, exactly. They had like a little box for us. Oh, mine. Okay. Where are we? Was. Wave or something. Okay. <laughs> so, so mine had to. Ours had to do with Aaron's Dynamic. and and the pleasure thing really stuck with us. Um, so of how so can we bring pleasure into all of these um, instead yeah. of separation? Good separation needs. seems to be the theme Taking of everybody's. Of. Cool. Um, you know, Sweet. chosen their corners. And so something about bringing people together so that they can know each other and. And then you're going to fight for them to be able to stay. Beautiful. Penelope. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> I, I work with Free Farm Stand and the mission. It's been going on for seven years. Um, I guess we kind of tied it all together by um, what we do is we pull all the leftover food from all the from all the farmers markets in the city. What's your question? And I, we just tie it, all, I'm going to tie it all together. Okay. And so we give out this leftover food for free to the community in the mission. Um, it's supporting of the mission. It's supporting of um, anti-eviction and getting to know your community and deciding to root down and not fly away, but actually be involved on the street level, which, which creates an enormous amount of pleasure because you're getting to know all your neighbors and mm. you're supporting each other on a grassroots level. Thanks. Thank you. Right there. Uh, give it to me as a question. Okay, regarding the food issue, how would curbing food waste better prepare us to face the challenges of climate change? Mm. Beautiful. Right here. Beautifully done. Yeah. Uh, Can gentrification be considered violence causing migration? Woo! Yes. Anybody else? It's a little like Jeopardy. <laughs> I was I was wondering how you know how you do this without like one of those things where you go. Um, th that was anybody else. We've got a minute more right for here. right here, Penelope. Your inquiry. Yeah. Thank uh, you. In response to Fabiana's presentation, how can we make joy sacred? Mm. Oh. Sorry. I, now I'm silent. Um, thank you. Any more? Yes, up here. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, in order to eliminate forceful migrations, how can policy making continue or evolve in supporting the least privileged tenants? Beautifully said. Beautiful question. We actually have time for one more. Yeah, right here. 
All right, so this was for Faviana. So how can we empower each other to allow our work to be both pleasurable and gratifying? Beautiful. <laughs> kind of the eternal question. Um, Jonathan, do you see uh, uh, any more? Do you see any more? Back to you. OK, so assembled instigators. <laughs> What the heck are we going to do with this? <laughs> All right, we, I think, if I understand, we have, okay, we have 10 minutes, and our job now is to sort of think about these questions and see what we can do ourselves to distill, to further instigate. What, what's on your minds? In terms of narrative, I just start going through other people's really good questions. Um, part of... Part of being a novelist is to really digress. It's what we do best, <laughs> um, and what the form does really well. Um, but to be to remain on point is is a part of an ed editing process, such that the narrative moves and the characters move in in, in, a, in a succession of better questions. And so, in my head, when I'm hearing what you're saying, I'm checking off in my head where does the pleasure come from. Uh, the conversations I have about baseball, conversations around the coffee in the morning, the, these pleasures and stuff that came up, how the sustaining foods come up, how those questions come in into the migration questions. In my head, I'm thinking, how does this apply to my characters, and, and have, I, have I incorporated these questions, beautiful. and which ones yeah. do I need to yeah. evolve? Yeah, beautiful. How about over here? I mean, you, you guys are involved in fairly major systems change ideas. What happened as you were listening to all this? Where, where did the question go for you? Um, well, I'm great. Uh, it's great to hear the notion of pleasure introduced because I feel like a lot of uh, thinking about conservation is more along the lines of like, you know, doing less, using less, whatever. And so, in a way, that was the most exciting thing about embarking on this project was learning about how actually food has the potential to reverse climate change yeah. and recapture that carbon. And it's not about doing less or denying yourself of something, it's just slightly changing the mode of production to one that uh, reverses climate change. I'm gonna I'm go over to Fabiana for a second. How do you react as you listen well, to these two? Yeah, so when I think of pleasure, I think of how do you experience the universe through all your senses. Um, and that means connecting with how you eat and understanding the planet, connecting to the planet. So um, I, I think that there is a lot to be said that actually factory farming causes immense amount of suffering. It's not pleasurable. It, it, it hurts the planet. It hurts animals. So I, I think very much that there's alignment there, just like being able to be safe and being able to be not displaced causes safety and people to feel rooted and connected. One, one thing that is also kind of like uh, tough for me is is because I uh, growing up in a place where we were always like, oh, we have to struggle. It's about the struggle. I think that we, it, I think the struggle sometimes is not inviting and is not appealing. Like we already are struggling a lot in our life. And I almost feel like suffering is put as a spectacle. And as an organizing strategy, I question that. And I wonder if we can organize from a place of power and resilience and joy instead of, uh, of, of a suffering narrative because it, it, it gets, it, it's just overwhelming. It can feel too much. Beautifully a segue to what I wanted to hear you talk about. Yeah, no, I mean, no. this is the woman who's, who's asking us how to sustain a struggle, so. No, I like that. And, um, I think while you all were talking, I was thinking if I was going to be in the audience, I would want to think these questions together because I think they really actually do fit together so perfectly in, in a particular way. Um, and I, I agree that I think that the struggle needs to be pleasurable. Maybe it, it shouldn't even be called the struggle. But I think that a lot of our actions that we do actually are joyous. And when people come together, there's something really important that happens. So whether you're painting a mural or you're protesting in the streets, but I think that one of the problems that we're encountering right now in San Francisco is um, maybe because of the time that we're in, in terms of technology taking over everything, people think that they can do most of their organizing by you know, clicking a button or by engaging in some sort of feud online. Um, and I, I think that we have to step out of that and realize maybe petitions are important and do have roles to play. And it's really important to communicate. And we're communicating so quickly. But it's, it's hard to get a lot of people out in the streets right now. I think it probably, at one point, might, might have been easier. But I think when people are out in the streets or when they're painting a mural together, when they're eating together, when they're distributing food together, that's where, that's where the systemic change happens. And that's where pleasure is generated. And, and maybe that will keep people from having <laughs> to migrate um, 
That well, I was thinking of your picture, Robert, of you out, you know, I mean, just, you have to be out. You have to, to sort of your point, you, I mean, and part of what I think you're saying back to us is um, by tying these things together, we're, we're able to think uh, with joy about, you know, these huge and, and sort of potentially devastating questions. Um, I was thinking about eating and how someone like me who's tried to live a, you know, a very careful vegetarian diet because I care so much about the planet, you know, sometimes it's painful. And I was thinking, why does it have to be so painful? You know, how can I return to some more pleasure in that, in that you know, very mindful of that. Um, so uh, back to you for a second. You've heard all of, of us for one minute more sort of digesting what you've said to us. How do you want to make this inquiry better? If you have something more to say to us, now's your chance. N now, now, now. Over there, Bob. Yes, please. Yes, can you, um, you probably have to yell at this. Well, here comes the mic. I, I can project. Okay, feel free. <laughs> I was thinking, what would it look like if corporations or organizations that employ people felt um, an ability to allow their employees to have a day to do something to uplift their communities. Mm -hmm. If they allow them one day a month, one day every two weeks, where they could actually engage, because it's so hard to actually balance your work and your life together, and then to add upon that another layer of activism. Sometimes people think that it's better to sit behind a computer and click a button, but if they had one day, eight hours, to be free to engage in some, to sustain a struggle of some sort, what could that look like? Beautiful. Over there? This way. Yeah. Hey, guys. Hey, so it sounds to me, and if I'm distilling this correctly, that the joy is found in the established community while, while you're moving this thing along. This thing uh, might be a struggle or what it, what, what's, you know, whatever you want to call it. So maybe I guess as a question is how do you then inspire or sustain community, or another word for community might be interconnectivity, in order to further or sustain a movement? Beautiful. So back to us for the last few minutes that we have. Um, Aaron, I think you were actually the one saying to me, while you guys were working, we were talking, and, and exactly that was what was sort of coming up, which is how do you create the interconnectivity? How do we do that today? Any thoughts? Go ahead. Well, first, I think uh, what you said was so great, which is I, we live in an extractive economy, which extracts workers, extracts from the earth, and you just to exploit. And if we understand nature and the natural laws of nature, it's regenerative. So I love what you said. How do you invest and regenerate your community, your workers, so that there's plentifulness and there's joy and not just extract? Go. Big problem, you got Citizens United, you basically have a corporatocracy being dominated by the tech industry right now. And so you have uh, uh, corporations being taught that they're people. They're not, so they don't feel and they don't care. Uh, and so uh, that's being consolidated there. And the, uh, the recoil or the, uh, the, the reflux from that is you also have laws that are instated that corporations are responsible by law for their stockholders, not their workers. So until those two things change, you're gonna have a complete, what we've seen is a zero one percent of this country is going to continue to have the wealth. Corporations are gonna continue to have all the wealth in the narrative. So revolution's gotta come on that level. Uh, and that there's gonna, hopefully there'll be some pleasure in the revolution, but that has to stop first. Here, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if the most powerful voice in the room is always the one with the money, we're sort of screwed. Um, Sorry, but that's true. Um, um, no, I, I agree. I think that you know it's the, a, a major problem right now that the big corporations that are ruling the world are so um, fragmented in terms of their worker force, and like there's no big union in the tech industry. Um, other, I mean, there are union unions forming and alive within like shuttle bus driver worlds and cafeteria workers and service industry work. But a lot of the people being exploited who are you know, creating capital that are, it leads to this political economy of dispossession um, don't see themselves necessarily as being exploited. So I think that we need to think about ways that um, within these systems of labor, people can work together to right. fight. Interconnectivity. So Anthony, any other thoughts from the standpoint of your work about how to create more interconnectivity? I know you and I have talked about it before, but how would, what's your thought? What's a thought you can add? 
Um, I mean, I think it goes back to the subject of the whole panel, which is the city and kind of just, uh, you know, we're, it's a concrete jungle, but we, sh we can use the resources of the ideas and each other to try and get there. Any closing moments of... There was a Nobel Prize economist that said the only connection he saw to the discrepancy of wealth satellite in a way in the last hundred years is the inverse proportion of unions. Unions have been completely, for all their problems, have become smaller. I mean, he, he sees the connection right there. So hopefully this will be a big union here at the Yerba Buena Center of people coming in, having their questions and defining their questions. And it can be welcoming. The thing I loved about this discussion is the fact that it immediately became a process of connecting. I mean, that was the immediate response of the audience to uh, these four wonderful uh, instigators. Um, we have exactly no time left. It's going the other way. It starts to count back up, you know, when you're out of time and you sort of go, whoa, did we get more time or not? But I think that means we're out of time. So could I uh, ask you all to stand up and give these four people a uh, standing ovation? Thank you so much. Woo.